of you already tuned in. And I think it's time we get started. So we're thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the Quantum Information Life Seminar series dedicated to the research and academic communities. The seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern Time and will be hosted on the Kiskid YouTube channel. So you can always go back and watch these afterwards. I'm your host, Zlatko Minev from IBM Quantum Research. And today I have the pleasure of hosting Aggie Branchik. Aggie will present some very nice results on customizing light sources for emerging quantum technologies. And hello, Aggie, how are you? Hi, Zlatko, I'm great, how are you? Oh, it's a pleasure to see you. And um, where are you tuning in from today? Uh I'm tuning in from Waterloo, Ontario, in Canada, otherwise known as Quantum Valley. <laughs> I love that. Yes, I was I had the uh, chance to be in the Quantum Valley uh, maybe last year and had a good time. Didn't have the chance to come up to the Perimeter Institute, so maybe next time. Mm -hmm. um, Aggie is a Psi fellow. Uh, Psi is in the wave function. That's, that's quite a title to <laughs> hold. At the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Uh, she is an adjunct professor at the University of Waterloo, an affiliate member at the IQC Institute for Quantum, of Quantum Computing. Uh, it's quite a few titles to also hold. Uh, earlier, she was a founding member, uh, editor of the Quantum Journal, a post uh, tutorial fellow at UT, uh, of Toronto. And before that, she did her PhD at Queensland University. I uh, was very pleasantly surprised to find a, an interesting course on scientific writing on her website and career trajectories. So I think you have very broad interests and uh, I, I recommend those. And uh, I think maybe while Aggie, you pull up your slides, mm -hmm. I can say a few words about uh, the format of the presentation, which will be interactive. You can ask questions during the talk in the comment sidebar. And I think uh, maybe two of the main takeaways from Aggie's talk today are that parametric down conversion is amazing and versatile, and we can now control it in ways that we haven't been able to previously. And so I'm really looking forward to Aggie's talk. Uh, so with that, I'll um, let you take over. Thank you. Uh, can I just check that you can see the slide? And I think I can see the uh, presenter side of the slide. So maybe we just oh. have to flip the screens uh, I can see the uh, sh the, oh, the notes here. You, can you, okay. Or wait, hang on. Let me, is that okay now? Yes, and I think now we have the right slide. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, uh, oh. thank you, Zlatko. No. And Aggie, I think whatever just happened, switch them back. So I apologies to the viewers here. We'll we'll okay. fix this up. We just can you so swap the screens? I, sorry, do you want me to swap it or are you swapping it on your side? I think we can swap the PowerPoint screens. We have uh, the interesting challenge that we always find in research, which is that things always seem to find ways to trouble us. Because um, <laughs> right now, I think I can see your presenter view rather than the sure. main view. Okay, so I will swap it and we'll see. So somehow it keeps... Uh, Okay, All fantastic. Right. Sorry about that. Uh, it worked fine in the sound check, so <laughs> but anyway, okay, right. let's, let's go on. So, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for being here, and uh, thank you to Zlatko for the introduction. And I wanted to say hello to my family in Poland. Uh, okay, <laughs> so let's get started. Um, so, quantum light, uh, it's, uh, this talk is going to be about quantum light, and quantum light is uh, super interesting in its own right. Uh, but it turns out that it has many different applications. Um, so some of these applications are in the uh, field of quantum information. Uh, so for example, there are uh, companies out there that are developing all optical quantum computers, uh, like PsiQuantum or Xanadu. There are other companies that are developing um, quantum computers made out of physical qubits, for example, IBM. Uh, so those companies will also require quantum light um, in order to connect the different uh, physical qubits. Uh, also, light is our best medium for sending information, uh, so it's ideal for quantum cryptography and communication. There are people who are also um, exploring, uh, exploiting the quantum properties of light for spectroscopy and metrology. So, for example, um, uh, there are proposals to send quantum light into uh, the LIGO interferometer to help with gravity wave detection. 
Uh, also, quantum light is being used for foundational physics. So the famous uh, Bell experiments from a few years ago, they were done using quantum light. And it's a great medium for, um, for studying analog systems. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on a particular method uh, for, uh, for generating quantum light called spontaneous parametric down conversion. And that relies on a second order um, optical nonlinearity. There's also a related method called spontaneous four wave mixing and that relies on a third order nonlinearity. And I won't talk about that here, but I wanted to kind of uh, put it into context and tell you that um, both of these are under the umbrella of nonlinear quantum optics. And there's also a completely uh, different uh, method for generating quantum light that uh, is based on single photon emitters, such as single atoms and quantum dots. And there's lots of awesome research being done in, um, in this field, but I'm not going to discuss that here. So in this talk, I'm going to just focus on parametric down conversion. And maybe there's an interesting just point here, because this always catches yeah. me, I think, when watching more optics talks, you know, it's, it's four wave mixing, but it's the three wave nonlinearity, even though it's four body terms. So we, it, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's an interesting convention. Um, yeah, so one way to think about it is that the, the linear term, um, which is, you know, the, the first order nonlinearity, uh, that has one input and one output. So that's two fields. And then so you always add one field and one uh, layer of nonlinearity to it. Um, but anyway, okay, so um, let me just give you an overview of this, this talk. Um, it's going to be broken down into three sections. First, I'll give, um, uh, give you a toy model description of down conversion and highlight the many different uh, flavors of quantum light. And then I'm going to give a review of joint spectral shaping. So the spectrum is a really important property of the, um, the light that uh, is generated by down conversion. And then I'm going to um, focus on some, uh, some of my research with my colleagues on a technique that we call customized polling. And this really takes joint spectral shaping to the next level. Okay, so let's start with the first bit, uh, toy models of down conversion. So uh, when it comes to down conversion, there are two big um, uh, key elements. There's the laser and the nonlinear crystal. And um, so as a theorist, I draw the laser and the nonlinear crystal like this, but in reality, they look like that. And so here is an example of a um, KTP crystal. And on the right here, I've just given a few different um, examples of uh, various crystals that people use. Okay, so typically the laser is going to emit some uh, electromagnetic field, which we call the pump. And that's going to be incident on the nonlinear crystal. And then most of the time the, the laser is just going to pass through the crystal. So this is the linear effect. And, uh, but occasionally what happens is that a photon in the pump field uh, splits up into a pair of photons satisfying energy and momentum conservation. And so this is this nonlinear process, the one that we're interested in. And so because we don't really care about um, the, uh, the linear process, typically we don't draw it in the diagrams, even though we know that it's actually there. Okay, and we can model this interaction uh, using uh, interaction Hamiltonian. So here I have um, uh, creation operators. So these are just like your regular um, ladder operators in quantum mechanics, but here they represent the creation of photons. And so we have two creation operators representing the creation of uh, this pair of photons. And you may uh, notice that there's no creation operator for the pump field, and that's because we, um, or destruction operator for the pump field, but that's because we treat uh, the pump classically. And so the pump is really captured inside um, this uh, interaction strength, which depends on the intensity of the laser as well as the strength of the, the nonlinearity in the crystal. Okay. Um, and so then if we want to calculate what the output state is from the down conversion um, source, we just solve the Schrodinger equation. So the solution is given by this unitary operator acting on the vacuum state and the Hamiltonian is uh, inside the unitary operator. And then when we expand it out using a Taylor series expansion, we see that the state that comes out is going to be a superposition of the vacuum term, a superposition of a pair of photons being created, a superposition of, oh, sorry, a superposition of the vacuum term, a, a pair of photons, and you know two pairs of photons, and so on. So uh, this superposition of states uh, captures the fact that this process is, is kind of a spontaneous probabilistic process. 
And if we were to write this in closed form like this with the sum running from zero to infinity, we would see um, that we have a state that's actually entangled across these two modes in the photon number degree of freedom. And so even though I didn't really tell you what these coefficients are, you may recognize this state as being a two mode squeezed vacuum state. And so the, the two mode squeezed vacuum state is, is quite amazing. It shows up everywhere. Uh, of course, it shows up in uh, things related to optical quantum information. So it's a, it's a great resource for um, uh, continuous variable quantum uh, information protocols, for example. But it also shows up in other areas of physics, uh, for example, um, in the uh, descriptions of uh, entanglement across the event horizon of a black hole or the entanglement across the event horizon generated when, um, when you have an accelerating observer, um, something known as the Unruh effect. And so it's, it's really like neat that, it's, uh, that we see it in many areas of physics. Um, you can turn this two-mode squeeze vacuum state into a different state. For example, if you uh, just throw away one of the modes and look at um, the quantum state of the other mode, and you find that it uh, takes on the form of a thermal state. And so this kind of um, extends this idea that, uh, that, that we have entanglement across the uh, two parts of the event horizon of a black hole. And then uh, what we see is only one side of that, which is thermal radiation, otherwise known as Hawking radiation. Uh, but it might also be useful to create a state like this in the lab. For example, if you want to use it to study uh, maybe quantum coherence of photosynthetic systems in a controlled environment, but using something that uh, kind of simulates sunlight. Um, another thing you could do is put a, um, a photon number resolving detector on the mode, um, on one of the modes. And if the detector goes click and says, I have two photons, then you know you prepared a two photon state in the other mode. Uh, the most common application here is as a form, as a way to create um, single photon states that are used in quantum information experiments. You can also collapse the two modes into a single mode and uh, create what's known as a single mode squeeze vacuum state. And so this state has reduced amplitude, uh, sorry, reduced uncertainty in one degree of freedom uh, and increased uncertainty in the other degree of freedom. But this reduced uncertainty um, makes it a, a good state uh, to enhance precision like in the LIGO experiments um, that I described earlier. Um, another thing you can do is send this uh, squeeze vacuum state through a weakly reflecting beam splitter. And if you do that, and then uh, conditional on detection of a photon in the reflected mode, you know that you've prepared something called a Schrodinger kitten state in the other mode. So this is a Schrodinger cat state, but it's only a little one with small amplitudes, so it's called a kitten state. Uh, another thing you can do is take uh, two small slices of um, down conversion crystal and rotate them and piece them together. And there, um, as long as you uh, pick the right polarization for the input pump, and as long as the, the slices are uh, shorter than the coherence length of the photon, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, of the photons, then you can create a uh, polarization entangled bell pair. So this is a state that's, I mean, it's just been the workhorse of most quantum optics, uh, quantum information experiments for the last 20 years. And this was the state that was used for the Bell experiment. Um, you can also put uh, one of these inside a, um, a cavity and create a frequency comb entangled state uh, or cluster states. These are universal for measurement-based quantum computing. Um, you can create orbital angular momentum. So there's really just like so many different states that, states of light that you can create using these systems. It's, it's really versatile. So if you want to know more about any of these things, I have a bunch of references here. You can just take a screenshot now or uh, just send me an email and I can, I can send these to you. Okay, so, so given the fact that um, down conversion is amazing and has uh, so much versatility, it's probably worth for us to try and understand it a little more. So we're going to uh, increase the complexity of the models that we use to describe it. So already um, I was kind of implicitly assuming that the two photons that are coming out are the same frequency, but uh, it's possible that the photons are going to uh, have non-degenerate frequencies, so they might be different. I've also been implicitly assuming that the uh, photons have a single frequency, but in reality, they might have some kind of frequency distribution. And I've also been implicitly assuming that there are no correlations between the photons um, beyond you know, the, the photon number correlations, but they could also be correlations in the spectra. So for example, the, um, 
low energy photon on this side could be correlated with the high energy part of the photon on that side. So we want to have a way to capture those, um, those frequency correlations. And the way that we do this is using something uh, called the joint spectrum amplitude. So it's this two dimensional function where we have uh, one frequency on one side, um, the other fre frequency for the other photon on the other side. And then uh, in the middle, we plot, um, it's usually a color scale where certain colors represent regions of high amplitude and the rest on the outside are regions of low amplitude. So for this talk, I will focus a lot on this joint spectral amplitude. So in, in the next part of the talk, I'm really going to dig into um, how we would actually model the joint spectral amplitude and how we would shape it. But I thought maybe this is a good time to pause Slatko if there were any questions that people want to ask. Yeah. And if not, I, I can keep going. I think we're good for right now. Okay, excellent. So let's now dig into uh, spectral shaping. Oh, um, sorry. Maybe the question yeah. that was—I uh, I missed this one. <laughs> the the mm -hmm. question that was going around is, you know, we've we've represented the the green box, um, but maybe the maybe that you've purposefully left it a little bit vague for now. Uh, mm -hmm. That it's some sort of nonlinear crystal, right? Some chi medium or something yeah. like that. Um, yeah. Um, so I I, I I guess we we can just clarify that. Is that a Thank question you. or? <laughs> I may have answered the question, but feel free to oh, correct okay. me. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, 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 yeah, it's a, it's a chi to nonlinearity, yeah. Great. Okay, so, yeah, let's dig into it um, a bit deeper. So, we're going to uh, complicate this model even more. Um, and uh, so, to do that, I'm going to really um, now consider that we don't have just single frequency fields. Um, I'm going to consider all potential frequencies. So. Uh, our Hamiltonian is going to be the interaction of three different field operators. And uh, I'm going to have a function here, uh, which we call the nonlinearity, and I'm, I'm letting it have some uh, positional dependence. In you know, the way that I'm drawing it here, the crystal uh, has just a constant nonlinearity um, inside the crystal, and of course, no nonlinearity outside. But um, in, you can imagine, at least in principle, that it depends on position. And then we have. Um, Actually, no, yeah, all the nonlinearities in there. So um, what we can do is do uh, a plane wave expansion of the electric field operator. And uh, so that's what I'm showing here. And it's pretty much the standard plane wave expansion, except you may notice that there's a frequency dependence on this, on this wave vector here. Um, and so that's going to become important. And even though, even though this interaction Hamiltonian is uh, more complicated than what we've seen before, it's actually already quite simplified. I had to make a few assumptions already. So I'll just kind of list these assumptions. Uh, I'm assuming that I have distinct modes uh, between the input and the output field. So we can really put labels on these operators. I'm assuming a quasi 1D geometry. So typically this would be a volume integral, but we're just integrating over one spatial dimension. Uh, I'm assuming that the pump field is classical. So you may have noticed that there's no hat on here. And that's um, because we're treating the pump as a classical field. So um, in the expansion, we would be replacing this A dagger with the, this classical, um, just this complex function, which represents the input field. And I'm also assuming that the pump field doesn't deplete. Okay, so this is, yeah. And, and quick question. So the origin of this mm -hmm. Hamiltonian, uh, in, in the absence of the pump, what, what, are, what is the form of the E field part? Um, in the or this is just uh, yeah the the actual sort of intrinsic um, nonlinearity term that gives rise to to this in the presence of the pump. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, I understand the question. So I mean, it's an interaction between three fields, and mm -hmm. um, it's um, so usually these three fields would be three. Um, uh, quantum mechanical fields, but then we replace one of them with a, um, a classical field. But I'm, I'm not sure. You mean where does the Hamiltonian come from? No, I, I think that's that maybe is partly answering it. Um, it's you, you know the um, treatment here of the pump is classical, right? And we could mm -hmm. obtain this. Um, by either just taking that quantum operator to be classical or by displacing that operator and saying that, well, now it's a displaced 
operator which has some vacuum fluctuations plus uh, a classical piece uh, of it and then you know when you multiply things out you can then then get out uh, this classical term times times these ones uh, but I guess I think what you're saying here is that sort of the, the, the zero point fluctuation part of this pump is just totally neglected for now and those terms we just forget yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. No, so I mean really this is just a uh, quadratic uh, interaction between two, two um, quantum fields and then this thing is just something that, that modulates the intensity of the interaction at, you know, at different times. Um, yeah. <laughs> Good. Thank you. <laughs> because I think of these in terms of very similar to, you, you know, in, in the superconducting qubit field, we, we usually have transmission lines that are generally linear, but then you can introduce nonlinearity in them by, say, mm -hmm. creating Josephson junctions, um, as, uh, introducing Josephson junctions sort of throughout the line. Now those junctions give you a nonlinearity that is uh, that goes like the electric field to the or the flux really the magnetic flux to the fourth power um so it's a four body uh, mixing term but i think you know mm -hmm. here we're really talking about a, a three body mixing term, or three wave mixing so yeah just clarifying that and between the community sure sure okay excellent thanks Gladko. um okay so let me just yeah maybe uh keep going um so okay so we have this Hamiltonian and we can uh, use it to calculate the output state again. And um, the way that we're going to do it is what we did before, um, solve the Schrodinger equation. Um, and then now we have this time dependent Hamiltonian in here and we can expand it using a Taylor series expansion. And um, so I'm only going to consider this, uh, this first order term, which is going to give us the pair production. And, um, you know, we could go through the entire derivation. It's not so difficult, but it's quite time consuming. So I, I'm not going to go through it here, but I'm going to just tell you that when you do go through and calculate everything, what you end up um, getting for this um, this term is a two photon state. So here we have the two creation operators acting on the vacuum, and then uh, they have a frequency dependence. And since we're integrating over these uh, two frequencies, the way you can think about this is that we have a superposition of uh, different frequencies, but it's a continuous superposition. And the superposition is um, weighted by this, uh, this function known as the joint spectral amplitude. And so this really tells us uh, about the spectral correlations between the, the two uh, photons. And this is what I introduced earlier. So this function j is going to really tell us about the shape of the correlations between the two photons. So if we actually went through and did the calculation, we would find that the joint spectral amplitude has two components that are, that are multiplied together. And um, the two components are uh, this pump amplitude function that, um, that describes the laser that we're sending in, so th this laser here. And this other piece, uh, which we call the phase matching function, and this represents the uh, material properties of the crystal. And so let's kind of go a little bit deeper and uh, look at the properties of these functions. So often we, uh, well, theorists like to model the, uh, the function as a Gaussian, uh, because Gaussians have really nice mathematical properties. Uh, but in reality, um, the shape could be uh, that of a sec function. So typically, pulse lasers have this shape. Uh, and we actually discussed uh, the consequences of that in this paper, if you're, if you're interested in that. Uh, in practice, it could, you know, it could really be any shape, though, because depending on what laser you have, you can have all of these different modes, uh, varieties, um, you know, fluctuations, and so on. So you could really take any of these things and plug it into this function here. Then the phase matching function, it uh, typically has this sync shape, sine x on x. And... Um, this sync comes from uh, the Fourier transform of uh, the top hat nonlinearity. Uh, another way to think about it is that if, uh, you know, when the laser hits the crystal, it goes from, you know, having zero nonlinearity to suddenly instantly this uh, nonlinearity is turned on. And typically when we have these, these sharp transitions, uh, it, it gives us wiggles in the conjugate variable. Um, this phase matching function, it depends on something called the phase mismatch, which is a sum and difference of, um, of the different uh, wave vector terms of the field. 
And uh, this depends on the refractive index of the material, which is going to have some kind of uh, frequency dependence. And so, so typically, um, if you wanted to actually model this, you would need to know what the, um, the dependence on the, um, on the frequency of the refractive index is. And that's usually captured by something uh, called the Fellmeyer equation. So um, because these things are typically um, measured in the lab, uh, people quote them in terms of wavelength, but you know, it's easy to convert between wavelength and frequency. And so let's say if you right now wanted to go and plot some joint spectral amplitudes, uh, what you would need to do is find out what the specific Fellmeyer equation is for your crystal. So the way to do that is you go to the website of uh, the crystal manufacturer that made your crystal, and um, you, know, you can find, for example, KTP, and uh, they give you all of these different parameters that describe the crystal, but the thing you're interested in is this Fellmeyer equation here. So you just pull out these numbers, plug them back into here, you know, plug this into there, into there, into there. You would then pick a length for your crystal, and you would pick some kind of model for your laser, and then you can uh, you know, multiply the functions together and get something that looks like this. So here I'm plotting the, the pump function with a Gaussian uh, cross-section. Here I've got the phase matching function, and I picked it in such a way that it's, um, that it's uh, diagonal here. And when I multiply them together, I get this, this joint spectral amplitude. So that's nice. You know, we have these, these functions that we can uh, uh, you know, plot, use to plot the joint spectral amplitudes. But if we actually want to start designing the joint spectral amplitudes, it's really worthwhile to break out all of the joints can we put to, to uh, get different design features. So I kind of want to go into that now. So, so one of the things that um, we can look at is, is uh, what are the features of the pump that we can control? Uh, so one thing we can do is control the, um, the mean pump frequency. So if we change the frequency of the laser, uh, we can have an offset in this, uh, this pump function. Another thing we could do is change the spectral width of the laser. So that's going to change the spectral width of this pump function. And another thing we can do is really just change the, the cross-sectional shape of the, of the laser. There are various uh, pulse shaping techniques out there that you can use. And then this, this uh, lets you tune the cross-section of this, this pump. When it comes to the phase matching function, we, we have sort of similar controls, but um, they're a little bit different. Um, one thing we can do is control the length of the of the crystal, and so it turns out that the the width of this phase matching function is inversely proportional to the length of the crystal. Uh, you can kind of think about this as a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If you have a really long crystal, then there's going to be uncertainty about where the pair of photons was created, and so if you have a large uncertainty in the position, you're going to have small uncertainty in the momentum. I'm going to skip over this one for now and move on to the, the group velocity matching. But here, um, what we can control is if you if you took this phase uh, phase mismatch and did a first order, uh, if you did a Taylor expansion and looked at the linear term, uh, you would find that this thing depends on frequency. And when you change that, you can change the um, orientation of this phase matching function in frequency space. Physically, what you're doing is controlling uh, what the relative velocities are of the of the different uh, pulses. So you can have the um, you know mode A travel at a different frequency to the pump, and then mode B also travel at a different frequency. And by tuning the relative velocities, you can tune the relative orientations here. Now, uh, uh, okay, sorry. So here um, we might want to also you know with the pump, we were able to shift the thing up and down. So we might want to uh, be able to do that for the phase matching function. And uh, so that would correspond to the zeroth order um, uh, Taylor series expansion term of the phase mismatch. But this thing does not depend on frequency. So it's not going to be something that we can tune uh, for a particular material. But it turns out you can do something called periodic polling, which lets you uh, have some control over this. So I'm going to just um, switch gears a little bit and explain periodic polling to you. So if you have just a regular crystal with some length L, uh, the phase matching function will be this thing function centered around zero. Um, now, shifting this um, 
the phase matching function up and down in frequency space would be the same thing as shifting uh, this function in delta k space. So what you can do is uh, take your crystal and at least imagine that you've split it up into different slices and then take every second slice and just rotate it by 180 degrees. And so what this does is it introduces some periodicity into the material and this periodicity adds an extra uh, momentum term to the phase mismatch. So essentially you just shift uh, this function uh, by some amount that depends on the periodicity of your material. Now, in practice, you're not going to be, um, you know, you, these things are on the order of micrometers, so you're not going to be cutting this thing up and, and rotating the crystal. But in, in practice, the way um, that it works is, so here's a microscope image of, um, of one of these crystals. So what they do is they put electrodes um, in, uh, on top of you know, the appropriate places of the crystal and then apply a voltage across the crystal. And then what that does is, it causes uh, an atom inside um, the crystal to tunnel to the other side of, uh, of this crystal plane, effectively rotating the, uh, you know, inverting the, the uh, crystal structure. And so then what you end up with is having different regions of the, um, of the crystal that, that are essentially rotated to each other. So with this technique, we get this additional button where we can shift the phase mismatch, um, shift the phase matching function up and down. And you can think about this physically as being a kind of momentum conservation. Okay, so we have uh, these three buttons for the, uh, the pump and the three buttons for the phase matching function. And by picking different parameters, you can um, you know, design the joint spectral amplitude to have uh, various different properties. Okay, so, so we saw um, in the pump, however, that we also had this additional um, uh, component where we could change the shape of the pump. So you might ask, you know, is it possible to change the shape of the phase matching function, uh, you know, given some particular crystal? And so this is going to be uh, the topic of the, the last part of the talk. So it turns out that you can, and the way to do it is using this customized polling technique that we developed. So I'm going to pause again and ask Sladka if there are uh, any questions at this point before I go on. I think there was uh, one question on uh, the periodicity in polling and relates, how mm -hmm. it relates to Bragg diffraction. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, the, it's definitely, it's not a Bragg grading. So a Bragg grading has uh, different regions of the, let me go back. Uh, so in a Bragg grading, you would have different regions of refractive index. Uh, so here I'm keeping the refractive index the same everywhere, and I'm uh, just changing the effect of nonlinearity. So it's a different process. Um, it would, there is a way to, to uh, you know, add bag ratings, and it does let you change um, the spectral properties, but it's, it's in a different way to the way that we do it here. Um, I'd be happy to share a paper later in the comments that, that shows how we can do that. Um, but yeah, it is a different person. Yeah. And, okay, um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. And, uh, and I think remind us again, why, why it's a sink in the phase yeah, right. matching function. Uh, so, yeah. So, um, you might remember when we saw the Hamiltonian, it had an integral over position. And mm -hmm. this integral was from, from minus uh, L on two to, to L on two. So it was an integral, uh, well, essentially an integral from you know, oh, I see. Uh, I see. one position to uh -huh. another position. And so you can, you can extend those limits to minus infinity to infinity and imagine that you're doing a Fourier transform of a top hat function. And it just turns out that the Fourier transform of a top hat is a sink function. Right, right, okay. So, it's, it's the, so actually this brings the, up a good, mm -hmm. a good point because um, you, know, you might imagine if you want to change the, um, the shape of the face matching function, maybe you could just uh, carefully tune the nonlinearity across this, this material. So let's say if you could gradually turn it on and then turn it off, maybe in the shape of a Gaussian then the Fourier transform of that would be a Gaussian. And so mm -hmm. you wouldn't you know, have immediately solved the problem. 
but in practice, because these are these are crystals, it's really difficult to continuously change the nonlinearity as a function of position. So you're kind of stuck with the nonlinearity being fixed. Mm -hmm. I see. And uh, and for those of us that don't look at JSA, uh, the joint mm -hmm. uh, functions every day, can you help us get in more physical intuitions for? Uh, you showed you know three examples. Um, how how we could interpret those in terms of the actual modes that one would see. Um, so I guess in terms um, of say the the, the coral, I guess it's you know can you think of it spatially in some sense, or or are you really stuck to think of it in the frequency I domain? Think you how think about it. I think you should. Hmm. So you could I mean you could take like a dual Fourier transform and think about it in the time domain. And so then mm -hmm. you, if there are correlations in frequency, then there are going to be correlations in time as well. So you can kind of, oh, anti-correlations in time if there are correlations in frequency. So maybe a physical picture would be to imagine the, the um, photons as being wave packets that are traveling um, you know, side by side or something. And there are going to be co correlations between uh, the arrival times of the photons. If you had some detectors waiting to, to detect them, there would be correlations um, uh, with when those detectors detect the, the photons. Mm -hmm. Nice, that's good. Thank you. Okay, okay so in, in the last part of the talk, I want to describe this uh, customized polling technique that, um, yeah, that I developed with my collaborators. So, uh, yeah, I, I showed this picture before where I, I tried to argue that one way to think about uh, this shift in the phase matching function is by introducing this, this grating, uh, which then gives you a momentum kick. But another way to think about it is um, to think about it as a, um, an interference effect between the phase matching functions of each of these little, uh, little domains. So um, you can imagine each, each one domain is its own uh, you know, crystal with a constant nonlinearity. And so each one is going to have a phase matching function that uh, is located here around zero. But each of those phase matching functions will have a different phase. So there's going to be a phase shift at each of these um, intersections. But then also because the, the uh, crystal components are at relative positions to each other, there'll be an additional phase um, uh, between between the different phase matching functions. And so almost by magic, it, it turns out that if you have this kind of structure, then you get destructive interference at delta k equals zero, and you get constructive interference at two pi on lambda. And the constructive interference is in such a way that you get um, this perfect sync function reproduced. And when you think about it that way, you might think, well, uh, do I have to have this periodic polling? Maybe I could have some kind of different customized uh, polling configuration. And if I pick this configuration just right, maybe I'll be able to, to create you know, some arbitrary function, maybe some you know, Gaussian function, for example. And so it turns out that, that this actually works. And this was um, something that, uh, that Alessandro Fedrici and I proposed at, uh, at the end of my PhD. And so uh, there, what we did is we, so we designed, uh, okay, maybe I should say one thing. So, so the, the number of these domains, it's, um, they could be like 2000 of them. And so the, the number of possible configurations that you have to choose from is going to be like two to the 2000. So that's, that's just huge. So it's really hard to, to find uh, what the optimal configuration is, at least it was at that point. We didn't really know how to, how to approach that problem. So we kind of took a, a naive approach where we just cut up the, the crystal into different sections and then had different regions of periodic polling, but uh, at different different um, uh, periodicities. And so th that worked kind of well. So you can see in, in this picture here, the green line represents the original sink shape that we, uh, we would have had. The black line corresponds to the Gaussian that we wanted. And then the yellow line corresponds to what we got. So we definitely were able to reduce these these ripples by uh, to some extent, but but not completely. Um, and so, but anyway, we we made this design, sent it off to the crystal manufacturers. They sent back this crystal, and Alessandro did uh, did the experiment. And so the experiment was great. The idea was great. Um, just the design at that point wasn't ideal. So then, over the next few years. Uh, 
uh, me and my collaborators and other people uh, worked on various ways of improving uh, the design of these of these um, these crystals. So we tried uh, some simulated annealing approach. But because you couldn't look at all possible configurations, we thought maybe you know you can somehow use simulated annealing to go through this landscape and find a, a nice configuration. And it worked pretty well, but it was just really uh, you know challenging to implement this algorithm. So it wasn't really picked up by uh, by that many people. Um, then a key paper was um, by Tim Basker and uh, and other people in 2016. So that included my my collaborators uh, Luke Halt and Mike Steele. And so this was actually a really great observation because they uh, found a deterministic way to pick the configuration um, that corresponded to the face matching function that you wanted. And then uh, we uh, added some bells and whistles uh, to, this, to this algorithm. Um, we introduced the possibility of having subcoherence um, length domains, which then gave you uh, full control over uh, not only the real part of the face matching function, but the, um, the imaginary part as well. So at that stage, we were able to, you know, generate whatever, um, generate a configuration for whatever phase matching function we wanted. And then after that, we pretty much started focusing on applications. What can we do with this? And so in, in this talk, I'm going to go through uh, these two um, applications, making high purity uh, photons and uh, pulse mode entanglement. So just briefly, let me uh, uh, tell you how the algorithm works. Um, here I have uh, two functions corresponding to a sync phase matching function and a Gaussian phase matching function. So the way to think about that is that the cross section here at the end uh, corresponds to the phase matching function uh, at the end of the crystal, but then you can plot the phase matching function at each point inside the crystal. And that's going to be each of these, these cross sections. And then you can pick, uh, let's say just one uh, point in the phase matching function and trace it uh, you know, from the end of the crystal to the beginning of the crystal. So maybe along this ridge or along this ridge for a Gaussian uh, function. And it turns out that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, the shape of this ridge and the shape of the phase matching function at the end. So what you can do is just you know, take the shape of this ridge and then work your way through the crystal. So you start at the beginning and you pick a domain, whether it's up or down, and see which one brings you closer to uh, where that ridge is. And then you pick the next one and next one. And as you make your way through uh, from left to right, choosing up or down, eventually by the end, you're going to end up with this configuration that corresponds to the phase matching function you want. So this gives us this, this last uh, button that we can use to arbitrarily uh, shape the, the cross section of the phase matching function. So let me just briefly uh, go into applications. So one of the applications is to make uh, heralded pure photons. So um, you might remember I showed at the beginning of the talk that uh, if you have your two-mode squeeze state and you put a detector here and the detector tells you that you have a, you've detected a single photon, then you have a single photon in the other mode. And you can then send that off into your, your experiment. Uh, if you have this correlated joint spectral amplitude, you end up actually having this, this mixture of many modes in this photon and many modes for this photon. So if your detector cannot distinguish between the modes of one of the photons, then your other uh, mode gets, or you know, your other photon gets uh, projected into a, a mixture, a mixed state of all of these different frequency modes. And so this is bad because if you take this and send it through your interferometer, uh, you'll get reduced uh, interference visibility. So um, with uh, Alessandro's group, and in particular Francesco Graffiti, a PhD student, we designed um, a uh, crystal with a Gaussian uh, distribution called Gaussian phase matching function, and then showed that the uh, joint spectral amplitude is going to be complete, almost completely decorrelated. So you only have two modes. And so this gives us a, a huge increase in the uh, potential purity of the single photon. So uh, the purity is, uh, something that ranges from zero to one. And what we want to do is try and get it to approach one uh, as closely as possible. So you can see here that we're getting very close to one. So then um, uh, they sent off the design to the crystal manufacturer who sent back the crystal and um, Francesco simulated the experiment using a re realistic pump. And because the pump has this um, sec shape, then um, the predicted purity was going to be only 95%, but still better than 80. Um, 
And then in the experiment, I guess I'm running a bit short on time, so I don't want to go too far into it, but they did a, a Hongo Mandel interference experiment from which you can um, extrapolate the purity. And they found that um, they experimentally verified the purity to be 90%. So not as great as you know, close to 100%, but better than 80. And most of the limitations are uh, not given by the crystal, but uh, the, the shape of the pump. Then uh, another application is uh, to create very interesting entangled states. So for example, with a- Oh, and uh, maybe Aggie, I, yeah? I missed a question yeah. that's, <laughs> oh, yeah. that's kind of interesting. Um, if if you have a phase matching function with, with you know, uh, the squiggles in the lab, um, can you get rid of those correlations with spectral fi filters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you can do that. Um, there are reasons why you might not want to do that. So if you're in the low pump regime, it's okay, um, because that just is going to you know reduce the, the number of photons you're getting, but it's fine. But if you're in the high pump regime and you have uh, those higher order photon number terms, then uh, by reducing those correlations in frequency, you pay the price of increasing, um, uh, well, reducing the photon number purity of your state. So you kind of gain purity in, in one degree of freedom, but lose it in the other degree of freedom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then Was the advantage here is that you keep a lot of, I know, uh, there's a just yeah, follow-up. Yeah. So then the advantage here of, of this yeah. technique is that you keep um, the quantum character of the light sort of much more pristine in, in general. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Okay. Thank you. So, thanks. Yeah. So here now we're doing something slightly different to um, to trying to reduce entanglement where uh, or reduce correlations. We're going to try and engineer the the um, kind of entanglement that we have. So here um, uh, we design a phase matching function with this negative and positive component, and then the joint spectral amplitude that corresponds to it has this negative bit and this positive bit. And it turns out that when you decompose this into the bases of the two photons, you get something that uh, that is a pulsed mode cell state. So it's a maximally entangled state in this basis, but rather than being encoded in polarization like what we saw before, it's encoded in the spectral degree of freedom, uh, but in such a way that the spectral modes are localized in both frequency and time, which is a really nice property if you're going to be using this for, um, for sending and measuring quantum information. So uh, again, they uh, did the experiment in Alessandro's group and Francesco led the experiment. They measured the joint spectral intensity from which you can infer the uh, joint spectral amplitude. Then uh, they did a entanglement swapping experiment, which is um, uh, kind of one of the most basic uh, quantum gates that you could do. Um, so to just demonstrate the viability of this for uh, quantum logic. And then uh, they also did a Hongo Mandel interference experiment. Uh, but what they found here is that, so for those of you that don't, uh, that aren't familiar with Hongo Mandel interference, uh, usually when you interfere two photons together, you get a shape that is the dip that hopefully goes, goes to zero. And so this dip uh, results from uh, this property of photons that um, they tend to uh, bunch together. So, so a dip would correspond to kind of two photons um, interacting on a beam splitter and then exiting in such a way that you never have one photon in each mode. You always have a superposition of two photons going in one mode or, and two photons going in the other. So they, they like to bunch together. But here, uh, when we get this peak, uh, it's kind of a, a property that well, it's a consequence of uh, fermionic behavior, behavior. So you would expect this to happen if you had two fermions interacting on a beam splitter and one will go one way and the other one will go the other way. So it's kind of neat that, uh, that in this Hongo Mandel interference experiment, we're seeing that these photons kind of have these characteristics of being uh, f uh, fermions. Okay, so, so yeah, that just wraps up the, the second um, part of the experiment. Uh, the second application of this, uh, this customized polling. So I'm going to uh, finish up here and just end with a, a take home message. So at the beginning of the talk, I, I showed you that uh, you know, quantum light has many, many different quantum applications. And that parametric down conversion is a really great way 
uh, of generating very different kinds of quantum light. And a really important property of parametric down conversion is the, the spectrum of the light that comes out, and in particular, the correlations between the spectra. And so if we're going to be uh, developing future quantum technology, we really want to have uh, you know, maximal control over all of these properties of, of the, um, the sources that we use to generate the quantum light. And so we already had quite a few uh, different buttons that we could press. So on the laser, we could you know, control the, the mean frequency, the pump width, the pump shape. And uh, on the nonlinear crystal, we could control the crystal length, uh, the phase mismatch, the group velocities of the relative fields. And uh, what I hopefully uh, convinced you of here is that we've been able to add one more button to this, um, uh, to this uh, toolbox. And, so, and it's a cool button because it really lets you uh, change the shape of this phase matching function. And the way that we do that is using this technique known as customized polling. So with that, I'm just going to uh, finish off. And thank you very, very much for your attention. And I'd like to just give a special thanks to Alexander Fedrici's uh, Edinburgh Mostly Quantum Lab, where the experiments were done, and in particular, Francesco Graffini for doing the experiments. And so, yeah, thank you, and I'm happy to answer more questions. Yes, thank you, Aggie. Um, I do have a couple questions. Um, I have two questions from John Donahue. W when you say... Oh, hi, John. Full <laughs> yes. <laughs> when you say full control uh, with subcoherence domain polling, does that uh, include some level of control over, say, the angle of the phase matching function, or is it 1D shaping? Uh-huh. No, it's just the cross-section. So you can change the angle um, using the other properties, so your group velocity matching, but um, the subcoherence domain just gives you more control over the, the real and imaginary parts of the phase matching function, so the cross-section. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, good. And uh, <laughs> this is an interesting question. <laughs> Which crazy manufacturer was willing to go along with this crazy plan? <laughs> How many trials uh, so until one actually worked? <laughs> no, no, it's like, it's, who, who asked that? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not going to give it away, but you can see the chat. It's John. <laughs> oh, <I know. laughs> so the, the, the um, manufacturer we used in the first paper was Raycol. I would need to check whether uh, they were the people that we used in the most recent experiments, uh, very likely. Um, but it's actually, it's not, not that hard. Like if you can do, like if you already have a good technique for doing periodic polling, then it's like not more difficult at all, I believe, to, um, to do custom polling. The only difference is that it changes the, the phase, well, the mask that you use um, when they um, kind of, I forget what the technique is, some kind of lithography um, that they, uh, you know, they create the mask and then they put the electrodes onto the, um, the crystal and then apply the voltage. So I think the only difference mm -hmm. in practice is, is the mask that you use. Hmm. Oh, very good. So, um, and I guess it's, it's fairly reproducible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, so in the Hong Mandel exper experiments, um, they had to make two copies of the same crystal in order to, to create two photons, um, two sep separate photons to interfere together. And yeah, they the fact that the experiments worked so well suggests that it's quite reproducible. Right. And then there's a clarification question, I guess. In the Hero the Single Photon Source experiments, uh, did you use the device combined with several periods of QPM? You said which device the the custom poles I think so I'm not I'm not sure so uh, essentially in uh, so in the heralded experiments uh, you just instead of having a quasi phase matched crystal a regular periodically pole crystal you just take the thing out and replace it with a custom pole crystal so mm -hmm. there's not any additional periodic polling going on all right very good and i think if there are no further questions i think that brings us to the end of our seminar um, and um so oh yeah or did you have something else you wanted to say aggie no 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 am i should i stop sharing my screen i guess or 
Oh, I, I think, uh, I, I, I think we're. Tell it. <laughs> oh yeah, you can, you can, uh, if you want to turn the camera on. Um, I'm just going to thank you and thank the audience for the <laughs> seminar, and you know, uh, take any final questions we may have. Let you say any final words you want to say. Um, but I hope that you enjoyed uh, coming to the seminar today and doing this virtually. Yeah, it was uh, really great. No, I really appreciate it. It was really nice. Yeah, and thank you for a very clear and lucid presentation and, and the uh, introduction of many examples at the beginning. I, I, I like that. You know, I notice you have strong emphasis on the clear presentation, which um, ties in well with your course on writing, scientific writing. Um, so uh, I guess, uh, go ahead. No, 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 I was just saying thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for being here today. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back next Friday with another uh, live edition of the seminar series. I believe next Friday we have Charlie Bennett, Charles Bennett from uh, IBM Quantum. And uh, it will be a very special seminar um, with, uh, with an early pioneer of quantum. And uh, we will also talk about manipulating light uh, but more on the quantum, even more on the quantum information side. So with that, thank you very much, and see you next week. Thank you, Aggie, for coming, and we'll see you around. Thank you, Zlatko. Thanks, everyone.